attempted to quote the famous statement by great German mathematician Riemann, I mean Riemann and geometry. He, in his notebook, he wrote that we think a given thought, and the meaning of this thought is expressed in the shape of corresponding neurophysiological process. So we can justify uh, this kind of discussions within the paradigm of paraconsistent logic uh, or Congress. And now, uh, let me request all the panelists to come to the uh, dais to take the seat. And uh, it will be for two hours. Uh, initially, it was 10 feet to the We are starting now at uh, 10 25, so we'll finish uh, if everything goes well a little bit uh, late. So, uh, in most of the cases of this kind of discussions, it becomes incoherent. But uh, uh, I am trying to figure out the list of the possible issues so that it, it is possible to make it more or less coherent discussion. So, what are these issues? So, uh, these are debatable issues, I, I figure it out, but maybe panelists might have some other issues in their mind, whether uh, brain computes at all or not, this is a burning question among the modern day neuroscientists. Then, uh, Brain, the journal Cybernetics published a uh, review of a meeting in the United States, uh, whether brain is analog or digital device, and of course the participants were John von Neumann, Norbert Wiener, Mac Polo, Pitts, and other neuroscientists. And that, that's a great discussion. Uh, but okay, we, we are trying to understand these kind of things even after uh, more than half a century later. So we have a lot of, uh, I think, uh, it has uh, developed already uh, from neuroscience perspective as well as uh, computer science or computability perspective. So we invited one neuroscientist also, he is uh, Dr. Jovi Joseph from Hyderabad University, so that uh, we can really understand what uh, brain talks about from neurophysiological point of view. And then uh, computability in the sense of Alan Turing, because uh, I am just reversing the order, brain contradiction and computability, let us start what is meant by computability, because I think some of us, we don't know or we don't have clear idea about uh, what exactly computability means. And then uh, there is another very interesting issue that brain not only process information but also interpret it. So le let me say a few words about it. The language, experience and ways of thought, say of communication engineering, seems to be admirably adapted to make us recognize explicitly that the nerve impulse is not merely some physical chemical event, but a physical chemical event carrying meaning. That's very, very important. We, we need to understand that. And then uh, computation in physics. What, because we, we are some physicists here, so we need to understand when we say computation and what is meant by computation in physics, both in classical and quantum computation. We have two uh, panelists, uh, Guru Prasad Kaur and Christian de Ronde, uh, they are from physics, so they will be able to say something on quantum computation as well as uh, difference with classical computation. And finally, uh, not finally, uh, after that, uh, brain exactly, uh, I mean, if you look at the perception, so logic is not the basis of perception, rather than it estimates the probability. And then, uh, whether the notion of computability depending on logic and Walter, he, uh, he is, I think, the expert on this issue because this is, this is a uh, Congress special in logic, so we need to understand whether uh, there is any connection between logic and computability. And then how brain really computes or whether brain computes at all. So uh, we say brain and pattern classification. We have expert, uh, VP Sina. He is uh, an expert on that and he did some work on this field, so let us listen what he said. And finally, goes to neuroscientist Jovi Joseph for brain talks about all these issues. Okay, so let us first start with uh, uh, Paula Sarkar who, who will explain what is exactly mean by computability in the sense of theory. Uh, and good morning to all of you. 
it's uh, nice to be here. Uh, I should uh, I should say that uh, at the outset I should mention that I'm not sure uh, how much uh, this talk will, go, uh, will be required since I uh, I'm not familiar with the area of uh, prior consistent logic, but uh, I do. I, I can see a lot of logicians here uh, by the discussions that I have been overhearing. And to logicians, of course, uh, notions of computability is, is old hat. Anyway, so Shishita showed me that there would be some people who may not be very familiar with uh, notions of computability as formalized by Turing. So in, in, in that respect, uh, I, I have this, uh, this very short introduction to the Turing notion of computability, or, or not, not really Turing, I mean, uh, notion of effective computability as formalized by Turing. Uh, this was also done by Church and Godel earlier. Okay, so to compute or not to compute? Well, uh, I'll start with what uh, is, a, is a very simple, simplified notion of a Turing machine. It's typically explained uh, using this, uh, this picture. So one way infinite tape divided into cells, and each cell contains a symbol from a finite alphabet. This finiteness is important, and at each stage, uh, uh, whatever I say will, will essentially uh, be over finite sets. Uh, uh, where the infinity comes in, I'll talk about it a little later. Okay, so this is a one-way infinite tape. It could be two ways, it really doesn't matter, but this is the simplest way to conceive a Turing machine. And uh, each cell contains one symbol from a finite alphabet, there is a, a, a head, well this is the head, and this is a, a finite state control, a control mechanism. This control can be in one of a finitely many states, and the head scans one symbol. So this is the basic picture. And how does it operate? Well, it operates via rules. Rule is that, you, that the machine is in some state, it is scanning some symbol, and then based on these two inputs, it decides what is the next step, what is the next symbol, and whether the head moves left, right, or maybe even stays put. Doesn't move. So that's uh, that's the rule. And you have a finite set of rules. So a finite alphabet is called the tape alphabet, over which uh, I mean, from which the symbols of the tape come from. You have a finite state of uh, set of states for the for this control and. Uh, you have a finite set of rules. Now, uh, what does this uh, do? Okay. So, what does a Turing machine model? So, this is the and this this is the picture that you can keep in mind, and it's a very basic picture. If you're not familiar, if you haven't seen this picture before, you can keep this picture in mind. That encompasses quite a lot. Uh, it, it's deceptively simple, and it's so simple that you one would think, oh, what's the big deal about? But it's, it's deceptively simple. It, it actually allows you to model a lot of complex behavior. So what does what does a Turing machine model? Well, computation, computation as we understand in, in the in the following manner. Computation as a finite <coughs> process. That's it. That is, it starts at some point of time and possibly ends at a later point of time. So there is a possibility not terminated at all. Of course, uh, there are some nuances there which I'll try to address in the next few slides. So computation can be discretized. So this is a kind of a digital. Uh, and discretized is may not be equivalent to digital, but it's a discretized. That is, the process can be seen as a sequence of distinct steps: step one, step two, step three, and so on. Each step performs one of a finitely many basic operations. So you have some basic operation at each step. You perform one operation. And what is the goal? The goal is to compute an output, which is a function of the inputs. So you have some inputs. You have a sequence of steps. At each step, you perform one basic operation, and at the end, uh, you accept or, or you compute some output. And uh, the typical formalization of a uh, of a Turing machine in the literature is that it accepts a language. So it accepts a language. Well, in, in, in function terms, you can say it, it computes the characteristic function of the language. Okay, so. So this is the notion of uh, computability that uh, that uh, that is formalized by Turing and notion of Turing machine. Uh, well, this immediately this kind of formulation immediately shows you that there are functions which cannot be computed. 
the existence of uncompletable function without really, I mean, this, this short proof will not really give you the function, which I'll try to explain in, a, in the next few slides, but a very short, brief counting argument will show you that, and you expect to have uncompletable functions if you use this model. So uh, the idea is that Turing machines can be encoded by finite length binary strings. And as I said, you have a finite set of states, you have a finite, set, a finite input alphabet, you have a finite set of rules. So essentially, all you have to do is just import the rules. And that gives you a Turing machine. There is some systematic way of doing it. Uh, it's not too difficult. But I mean, it's quite intuitive that uh, such an object, as I described, has a finite description and can be imported by a finite binary string. So the set of all finite binary strings is, of course, countable, and hence so is the set of all Turing machines. Now, the class of all languages, so if you just think of Turing machines accepting languages, well, then a binary language is a collection of finite binary strings, and a language is uniquely given by its characteristic functions. So if you look at the number of functions from the set of all the finite binary strings to 0, 1, so that's the possible set of characteristic functions that a Turing machine can compute, and possibly can compute. Then, uh, well, what you get is the, the, the set of possible languages is uncountable because the number of functions from 0, 1 start to 0, 1 is uncountable. So we, so we have this situation. There are countably many Turing machines and uncountably many languages. So maybe, I mean, and one Turing machine can accept one language. So it could be that several Turing machines accept the same language. But one Turing machine surely accepts one language, and there are too many languages. So there must be languages which are not accepted by any Turing machine. A very simple, very uh, intuitive uh, counting argument which says that, well, if this is our notion of computation, then, it, then there will be uncomputable functions. Now, whether this is the, the correct notion of computation, that, of course, is debatable. Okay. So in fact, yeah, most languages are uncomputable. Most in the sense that only a countable section of a portion of languages can be computable. Now, uh, well, once you know, have the notion of Turing machines, the, the, the class of languages accepted by Turing machines, well, they are naturally divided into two parts. Uh, this notion of recursively enumerable and recursive language. A language is recursively enumerable if there is a Turing machine which accepts L. And the language is recursive well, this is just uh, terminology coming from the previous formalization of, uh, of notion of effective computability in terms of recursion, recursive function theory. The language is recursive, recursive if there is a Turing machine which always holds and accepts it. Okay, so there is this, this difference between RE and recursive in the difference that we insist that the Turing machine must always hold for the language to be recursive. And, uh, and from this, it is not very difficult to see that L is recursive if only if L bar is and L complement is also recursive. So L complement is sigma star minus, or well, 0, 1 star minus L, so set of all strings which are not in L. Uh, a recursive language is said to be decidable, and non-recursive language is said to be undecidable. So there is, a, again, a nuance here. Uh, I mean, uh, things which can be computed by Turing machines, there is a difference which can be computed by halting Turing machine, or can it be computed by a Turing machine where you don't have this restriction on whether it halts or not. The notion of effective computability, or computation as you understand it, well, you probably expect a, a computation process to halt at some point of time. Uh, the notion of algorithms as formalized in computer science insists that an algorithm must halt. Uh, a, a process which does not halt is not called an algorithm. <coughs> so in that sense, it is this, uh, this class of decidable languages, so recursive languages, which is is considered to be essentially the class of languages which can be computed by, or by algorithms, something like that. But uh, formally, uh, this is the, the difference between recursive and non-recursive languages. Now, uh, for Turing machines, one of the most amazing things is this notion of universal Turing machine, which is the model of, of current digital computer. So again, it's a, it's a very simple notion and can be expressed in very short, without going into the technical encoding parts, can be expressed very briefly uh, in terms of intuitive uh, descriptions. So, so as I mentioned, that Turing machine can be encoded by a finite length binary string. So let this denote an encoding of M and define this language, LU, as the encoding of M followed by W, W is a string. 
such that M accepts them. So this is the language. So you have an encoding of a tuning machine. So you are kind of tuning, think of tuning machine as a program, as a modern day program, a, a, a tuning machine and an input. And whether the tuning machine accepts that input, the, the class of all such strings is called LU, which is uh, this U stands for universal, is in, in some sense the universal language. Now, there is a tuning machine which accepts LU, and the, the idea is simple. You have to construct another tuning machine which accepts this language, this language in the sense that it, the, so, so this, the tuning machine which accepts LU will be called MU. So MU, what MU will do is, it will take this encoding of M and then kind of simulate M and run it on the uh, string W. Okay. So just simulate M step by step and run it on W. And if, if M accepts W, then accept else just keep on doing what it does. So again, the, the actual encoding part is a little tedious, but conceptually it's rather easy to understand. So basically run M and W and accept if M accepts. And then a canonical, well, this canonical will depend on how you encode your tuning machine. Canonical tuning machine accepting LU is called the universal tuning machine. So universal tuning machine is capable of simulating any tuning machine on any. That's, a, that's the basic idea. And this forms the model of modern day computers. So uh, I'm almost near the end. So I'll just uh, briefly describe. Well, I've delineated uh, recursively enumerable. And then there is the class recursive. So are this this delineations kind of meaningful? So I have, of course, given this simple argument that uh, there are languages which cannot be computed. But can you actually exhibit one such language? A language which cannot be computed by a Turing machine. And then, is there a language which cannot be computed by a Turing machine which always holds? So are there, I mean, of course, there are non-recursively enumerable languages. The counting argument shows that, but can you actually exhibit one? And can you actually exhibit a non-recursive language? Again, this is, uh, it's, again, apart from the encoding part, the idea is simple. So this will involve some, some uh, uh, this will involve the diagonal, uh, diagonalization argument. One can enumerate all finitely and binary strings, W1, W2, W3, it's a countable set, just enumerate them. And MJ, is a Turing machine whose encoding is a binary representation of integer j. Now you think of this other two dimensional array, w1, w2, w3, the strings and the encodings of the Turing machines on the rows. And then you define this to be this LD to be the usual diagonal technique, the complement of the diagonal, that is LD is wi such that mi does not accept wi. This is called a diagonal argument. And then an easy diagonal argument shows that no Turing machine can accept LD. So, I mean, if there is a tuning machine which accepts LD, then it will deviate with itself on the diagonal entry. That's the typical diagonal argument. Now, if you don't admit diagonal argument, then this uh, this example won't hold. So, uh, maybe uh, I'm not sure whether you whether diagonal argument is acceptable or not. That is, of course, a different. If it is not, then this argument is not. I and mean, then uh, then you don't have this thing. Then how do you show that uh, there is a language which is non-computable? Uh, yeah, that's beyond. Me. Uh, a non-recursive language, well, this LU, this universal language, this is not recursive. And again, this is a proof by contradictions. If you are not admitting proof by contradiction, you are not in this game, actually. And <laughs> this game is a different game. You have diagonal arguments, you have proof by contradictions, uh, very typical classical logic. So this LU, well, LU cannot be recursive. If LU is recursive, then so is LD bar. LD bar is this WI such that MI accepts WI. That's clearly very similar to LU. So if LU is recursive, then so is LD bar, and hence LD would also be recursive, which we know is not true. LD is not even recursively anymore. So very, very short argument to show that LU is not recursive, and this LD is not even recursively anymore. Okay, now further consideration. So this is maybe the, the discussion point. Uh, knowing that, that a function is computable is, is perhaps not enough. So I can compute a function maybe in 200 years, maybe in 1,000 years. Or in some cases, it can, I mean, it could be very, very long, like it could be about 200 times. So knowing that a function is computable is usually not enough. You know. If a function cannot be computed in reasonable time, then it may not matter whether it is computable or not. So that's a question that uh, it's, a, it's a practical question, and it, it has motivated uh, computer scientists over the last uh, maybe 40, 50 years to build up this theory of computational computation. So of course. Uh, Delineating what is computable from what is not computable is important. 
But then, uh, even in the class of computable functions, knowing that, okay, this is a function I can expect to get its output in a reasonable amount of time. And here is a function, well, I don't know whether it can be computed in a reasonable amount of time. Maybe it takes 2 million years. Uh, then is it useful? Okay, so that's, that's uh, uh, one point. And the other point is, of course, these notions of probabilistic Turing machine and quantum Turing machines. Uh, of course, uh, Guruda will probably be talking about quantum Turing machines. Yeah. So I'll just uh, mention one thing, that randomized and quantum computations can speed up computations of practical tasks as formalized in the notion of probabilistic and quantum Turing machines. The quantum Turing machines can do factorization and so on and so forth. But uh, the way they have been formalized, they do not take you to uncomputable. So it's not that, uh, well, in, in this formal setup, of course, we have a different formalization, but in the formal setup uh, that we generally look at, probability does not get you to uncompatible. Probability, well, it can get you to improve on, on practical tasks, even that is debatable, but uh, they certainly do not take you to uncompatible. With, with that, I think I'll stop. So thank you, Paula. Now uh, we'll go to that. Yeah, again, I am going to my uh, slide because I have some uh, introduction before starting uh, for another panelist uh, talk. And uh, yeah, so uh, what is computation in physics? What do you mean by computation? Uh, a planet moving around the sun in a closed path. Is it meaningful to ask whether a planet computes velocity at each point of its trajectory? Or yeah, one German physicist, when I was a student, he asked me an interesting question that uh, think of a cavity full of, of, in which all the uh, spin states are filled up, electronic states are filled up. And now you are sending electron one by one. Then uh, how does the electron know that all the states are filled up so it will not be able to go into the cavity. Is this question meaningful? I am not able to answer his question. Now we have two physicists with us. Uh, they will explain what is meant by uh, classical computations and quantum computation in the context of physics and if possible they can generalize it more. So in the beginning, uh, let me ask uh, Guru Prasad to speak more about this. Put the mic a bit higher, a bit, yeah, yeah. Not so much, yeah. I am not expert or I don't work in quantum computation in particular, <laughs> but I will give some uh, general understanding. Uh, and I don't think that quantum computation by itself uh, doesn't solve this uh, basic problem of, uh, of uh, complexity theory, uh, but it does something, of course. <laughs> uh, so, so quantum computation actually has been popular because it can solve some of the it can solve some of the problems uh, in, uh, very quickly, which otherwise cannot be solved in classical computer. <coughs> so again, uh, the thing has been discussed, uh, discussed in this conference that superposition principle in quantum mechanics is a peculiar phenomena, and of course. We have seen that the superposition phenomena in quantum mechanics cannot be accommodated in, in standard logic. So the logic has to be developed to contain this new kind of uh, features that nature showed uh, for, say, uh, last uh, <coughs> hundred years. Uh, now, I have taken a simple thing, see how it is counterintuitive to us. Uh, look, there is a photon source, and now it is possible uh, to construct a device where you can send photon just by one by one. And it is a photon source, 
and there is a beam splitter which is 50, which 50% uh, beam splitter means if a strike photons the beam splitter uh, with half probability it goes up uh, I mean it is reflected and with half probability it is transmitted so if you send for from the photon source of 1000 or 2000 photons half of them will be collected in the upper director and half of them will be collected in the lower de <coughs> detector. Now, if you design this kind of experiment where there are two beam splitters because you have put reflectors so that the photon which is transmitted through the uh, first beam splitter, it is reflected and go to the second beam splitter. Similarly, if it is reflected, then again by the full uh, reflector it goes to the second beam splitter. Now our common sense tells that if I send photons one by one from this photon source, so again half of them should be collected in the upper detector and half of them will be collected in the lower detector. But in quantum mechanics you can design the experiment in such a way that you send photon one by one say 1000 photons and all of them are collected in the lower detector and no photon is collected in the upper detector. So no common sense if you think that photon, a single photon which is not divisible and if you send them and they follow a definite path which you may not know but if you imagine that it is following a single path at each time then you cannot explain this experiment. So this is this interference phenomena with a same where you can send particle one by one, then this common sense idea cannot explain this thing. Again, let you want to know, okay, if I imagine that photon is going through one of the path, it always choose one of the alternative path. So you can put a detector and detector is so find that it detects the photon but at the same time it allows the photon to pass through the path, then you will know the path but surprisingly then there will be no interference phenomena. 50% of photon will be collected in the upper one and 50% will be collected in the lower one. So if you want to know the path, then immediately you don't have the interference pattern. <coughs> So till you do not search for which path photon followed, I mean you allow the superposition between these two paths, then only you can get the interference pattern. So this is the idea. Now, <coughs> as Paul has described <coughs> this, in if you have classical probabilistic computation, of course classical probabilistic computation is still more powerful than deterministic computation. There, if you start from a uh, state, initial state, if you start from a initial state and say it goes to one of the four states, 0, 1, 2, 3, with corresponding probability P0, 0, P0, 1, etc. And then again, <coughs> if you allow them to go to another set of states like uh, 0 prime, 1 prime, 2 prime, 3 prime with corresponding probability Q00, etc. Then finally, if you compute the probability of finding the system in, a, in, the, in the state 0 prime, then you, you get the probability in this fashion, which, which you get from classical probabilistic theory. <coughs> I mean, the standard probabilistic theory. But in quantum mechanics, if you start the same thing from initial state like 0 <coughs> and you have another four possible state 0, 1, 2, 3 then in quantum mechanics it is uh, you evolve the state 0 from some combination of 0, 1, 2, 3 and it is linear combination of these four where this coefficient I mean amplitude can be in general complex number. So how do, how do you get the probability in quantum mechanics? You have to get the modulus of this coefficient which can be in general complex and take the square of it then you get the quantum probabilities. So this is the idea. Now if you learn 
in which a state the quantum particle jumps on 0, 1, 2, 3, if you know, then again if you evolve them to another set of states like 0 prime, 1 prime, 2 prime, 3 prime, and the corresponding quantum probability is again uh, this mod square <coughs> amplitude, then again if you want to calculate the probability that the quantum particle finally you find it in 0 prime the state, again this probability is almost classical like. But now the probability comes from amplitude, mod amplitude square. So this does not give uh, this does not uh, that that does not arise something uh, surprising. It is only that probability is calculated from the amplitude by using Born's law. But if you start from zero, you evolve the particle to some linear combination of zero, one, two, three, then again. You, you don't try to find in which states the particle comes, but you again <coughs> allow them to evolve to some linear combination of other some other quantum states, zero prime, one prime, two prime, three prime, and finally you want to know what is the probability that the particle collapses to zero prime the state. Then you have to calculate the probability in this fashion, which is different from earlier one. So A0, A0, Z, B0, which are in general complex. And you have to take the product and then take the mod square, summation over J. Then these two quantities are not equal. So this shows that interference phenomena is such that the probability which would otherwise have been finite, in this case the probability may turn to zero. So, so in quantum mechanics, you can control your uh, dynamics in such a way that with some uh, with, with some probability you you reach some state and also you destroy the possibility to reach some other undesired state. <coughs> so in quantum mechanics, <coughs> people generally tell that how the how the power of quantum computation, what is the source of, uh, of higher power of quantum computation? Why quantum computation is, uh, can, track some, uh, can, can solve some problem faster than in classical compu computation? What is the source? Generally, it is called parallelism. So what is parallelism? Let me give a brief description. So consider the evolution of the function a at many points like x1, x2, xa. Now I, have, I, I make a correspondence. I took two quantum systems, s1 and s2, with orthogonal basis for s1 is alpha1, alpha i, and for the system s2 it is beta i. Now I encode the function I to complicate x1 corresponds to alpha 1, x2 corresponds to alpha 2, xn corresponds to alpha n. Similarly, <coughs> I encode the value of the function at various points with another orthogonal basis for system S2, fx1 to beta 1, fx2 to beta 2 in this fashion. Now, in quantum mechanics, for every function, you can design a corresponding unitary operator where if you give the two input, S1 and S2, where S1 is in a state alpha i <coughs> and beta is in S2 in some fixed state beta 0, then finally you get alpha i, beta i. So you have, I mean, some unitary operation depending on the functions you want to compute, <coughs> it takes alpha i beta 0 and beta 0 is a fixed standard state, then you go to alpha i beta i. But interestingly, in quantum mechanics, instead of preparing the state again and again in alpha i and beta 0, you can construct a state like this in the same system. Like you can take a, for system S1, you can take the superposition of all the state, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, up to alpha A. So you can prepare your initial state of S1 in 1 upon root n, alpha 1, alpha 2, up to alpha n, 
and take Vita Zero again, the same standard state. Now, to run your unitary operator on these two systems, you see you get one upper group in alpha 1, beta 1, alpha 2, beta 2 in this fashion. So, you can tell that in this, with the same resource, as if the function has been calculated at so here you see that almost you have calculated the function on all points at just one function has been calculated at all points this alpha 1 beta 1 beta 1 means function has been calculated at at the point x1 beta 2 means function has been calculated at x2 the function has been calculated at all points at one go but alas you cannot use it. If you perform some measurement to low brazers, then you collapse one, one of them. So you cannot use this massive parallelism. But measurement to collapse to one term, revealing the value of the function at only one point. So you don't get any advantage from massive quantum parallelism. No gain. But sometimes, this quantum parallelism can be exploited to find certain global properties of the function, like period of a function, whether a function is balanced or constant, like this kind of global properties of a function, which for which in classical computation you have to learn, you have to compute the function at each point, in this case, using in a controlled way you can use this thing to learn some global properties of function by choosing measurement in a suitable basis. For example, source factoring algorithm is related to finding the period of a periodic function. And there are some other algorithms like searching method uh, that there is quadratic speed up. And there are also some other alg uh, algorithms. But there are some problems where quantum computation does not help. But anyway, now, for the time being, I finish. I have some other things to tell regarding the actual uh, subject of this roundtable discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Guru Prasad. Now, uh, I request next speaker, Christian Vironde, because he is also a physicist, and maybe he will elaborate uh, some ideas in uh, quantum computations. Well, thank you very much. If you like to come here, you can come. No, it's okay. Okay. So, well, as a matter of fact, uh, I really enjoyed the talk just, just given. I think uh, the idea of quantum computation is already uh, more or less explained. Uh, so, so, I'm going to be very brief. I, I will use my, my ten minutes of talk just I was reflecting about the title of the of the of the, of the meeting of the round table, and what I'm interested in highlighting is is maybe a problem which relates in a in a more uh, in a different in a, in a different level. Is this okay? Maybe I have to uh, in a different level, and and which relates. To the problem of of what what I'm interested in is more in the question of what is the meaning of a brain, which is within the title of the round table. So it was brain computability and uh, and contradictions. And to be honest, I don't know what a brain is. So so I hope to gain some something of this round table but of course there is a problem which I have a little bit outlined within my my own talk relating related to the distinction and, and the distance between language and reality so between formal schemes and mathematical representations and the fact that we do not have a self-evident interpretation for such such schemes so, so a formal scheme needs a certain interpretation and it is not self-evident it's not obvious there has to be some kind of force 
within the formal scheme in order to link it to the physical presuppositions. And in this sense, the, the, there are certain presuppositions involved within the, the, the relation between brain, computability, and contradictions. And I, I, I tend to think that there is a common view, uh, which, which is kind of the orthodox view, that physical description uh, can, can is able to capture the world, so, so, so that we are able, through our physical description, to capture the world. I tend to think that uh, there are several problems with that kind of presupposition. It is in itself a metaphysical presupposition. There is a quotation of, of Einstein, which I like a lot, to, in a letter to Erwin Schrödinger, Einstein wrote, the problem is that physics is a kind of metaphysics. Physics describes reality, but we do not know what reality is. We know it only through physical description. So here, uh, I think Einstein is highlighting very well the fact that there is an interrelation between physical description and reality. So at some point, we do not want to say that physical description is just a creation of the human mind because then we turn into some kind of pluralistic solipsism or some kind of relativism in which every physical description works so there must be some kind of discovery within physics so the fact that I can throw this and it falls at 9.8 meters of a square second has a certain meaning and I think at the time being, we are within that, that kind of problem, within physics, and that we cannot assume naively that we are capturing uh, reality as it is. You know? uh, Janives, in his talks, has highlighted this point in, in, in a certain Kantian manner, and I tend to agree with that, that point. The fact that an object is a kind of conceptual machinery which allows us to deal with experience. But when I say a pen, that concept, the, the notion of pen, does not capture completely this, which is here. So, in a certain sense, uh, the only thing I wanted to say, maybe, maybe there is some time later within the, the discussion, is uh, just to remark that the presupposition that there is a single description of the world, that physical description should be one single unity, is in a certain sense quite debatable, and so this also uh, leads to calling the attention to the fact that the brain as, as an entity well, might have different types of, of uh, descriptions, which, which I think is, 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 is uh, being discussed within this table because it is kind of very interdisciplinary. And finally, uh, well, just call the attention that in a certain sense, concepts are not in the world. So we don't find identity in the world. That, that's at least my stance. We, we, we do not find identity in the world. Identity is a way of, of dealing with the world, so it's a presupposition through which I can deal with a certain set of experiences. And I tend to think that the same happens with, with non-contradiction and with contradiction. Contradiction itself can lead us to a certain type of experience, and a new experience which hasn't been, been, been discussed. And in this, this sense, I, I, I am really grateful of participating in, in, in this conference. Uh, but these concepts are created, so, so in some sense there is an interrelation, as, as I said before, between the creation and the discovery, which has to be, I think, uh, discussed. And finally, just uh, as, as, as uh, another remark, I, I, I think that it is important also to consider the danger in this kind of 
naive correspondence between uh, physical descriptions and reality, mainly because this allows to describe uh, the world in formal schemes, but then if we take it too seriously, we can claim that these formal schemes really describe everything and derive conclusions which might, in a certain sense, uh, over uh, which might uh, go beyond that which is being analyzed. So thank you very much for. Yeah, I mean uh, the issues what uh, you are trying to say and what I understand from him that uh, one of the uh, really major challenge in brain function is to internalize the external world. That is one issue. Another is uh, how the concepts are being formed. So uh, the basic issue which uh, neuroscientists are trying to solve that uh, what is the cellular basis of cognitions. I, I look at the apples and uh, apple has a shape, apple has a taste, uh, might be it has a smell, so a lot of uh, sensory inputs are coming and they are integrated at some point in the central nervous systems. And then at a certain point we say, ah, this is apple. So the ah, it is apple, it's very difficult to understand what is happening inside brain. Okay, thank you uh, for this kind of issues you raised. And now, uh, you know that um, the recent developments of Bayesian approach to brain function, this indicates that probabilistic models are distinctly better than those based on formal logic, so as to understand the response properties of neurons. And the response of neurons at various levels of sensory hierarchy may be described better by probability than by formal logic. So again, the basic question is even whether logic is connected to computability and if possible, I mean, Walter uh, is a man who can uh, tell something about the formal logic, computability, and if possible connections with perceptions or brain itself. So Walter. Yeah, I will just show you. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. I'm very glad to give my, I'd be as brief as possible, trying to give my ideas on this kind of um, relationship between uh, quantum computation and product consistency based upon a work I have done with some students of mine. Uh, first let me go to this, uh, I think a very nice example, which is more or less related to the one uh, she shared, uh, mentioned about a if a uh, planet uh, is, could be seen as computing his, uh, its trajectory or not. So an example by Gaudi, the architect, he made a system of ropes to project the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, this famous cathedral. It was practically impossible to solve the system of equations which described the equilibrium of the system of towers and arcs. And then Gaudi simply took a ropes, I show you in the next slide, uh, how was a, a picture, took a rope corresponding to the arcs, tied them together, and tied the system to the ceiling, obtaining the mirror image of the projected church. So in this way, computed by gravity. Let me show you how. You see, this point here, so it's, uh, if you take the rope in an appropriate way, and take a mirror, then what you get is that. So, very much like a very complicated model of the cathedral, but done very instantly, uh, computed by gravity. So, important question is, is this a computation? Right? So, uh, uh, we, uh, we have now a definition of what computation is, but it's a definition. And related to this definition, we find this famous Turing thesis, which is a, uh, not more than a uh, philosophical hope but you cannot prove it. I will comment very briefly on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I I will take profit of um, the uh, expositions by uh, Palash and uh, Gur Prashad, and I go very briefly on these uh, things. But then, just to comment on this uh, story of uh, computing by gravity, we have this famous uh, church Turing thesis which says that any computational test can be performed on the universal Turing machine that was mentioned by Palash. 
So anything can be impressible computed by, by this kind of machine, but this is a philosophical thesis. We have no, we, we do not have any proof of that, and we cannot have. We could very possibly have a counterexample, if any, but up to now nobody found it. Not even quantum computation. Okay, so again, very briefly to intractability, as uh, Rashad mentioned, and I think Pallas mentioned that. Uh, Many problems are, uh, can be computed by a Turing machine, but cannot be computed effectively. So you have a very difficult problem of intractability by, by, by uh, classical computers. Uh, an example which sort of um, circumvents the, the problem of intractability is the Deutsche Yosha algorithm. Uh, the algorithm is, is more or less like that. If you, if you have any kinds, true or false, two heads or two tails, we know, we know that half of them are true and half of them are false. So the system is said to be balancing. But we do not know which. We do not know whether fake coins have two heads or two tails. We do not know anything. We may have fake coins among them. So a classical algorithm needs to make approximately two up to n minus one tests. So it's an exponential number of tests. But a, a quantum algorithm would solve the problem in polynomial time. So in principle, it would be much faster. It's a kind of a speed up. Yes. There are not many uh, quantum algorithms, but a, a substantial number of them, which make us, uh, give us the hope that we can find more and maybe take more profit of uh, a, a quantum computation. OK. Uh, he also mentioned uh, this uh, uh, Shor's algorithm, which is another one. Okay, but the problem is security, I mean, in practical life, security relies on tractability of computational problems. For instance, factor natural numbers into prime, which is computationally difficult. Thus, this is the core of a cryptographic protocol as RSA. But if you could really do, if you could f really find and construct or build a quantum computer, this would be a kind of a disaster for the, uh, the whole uh, economy, the whole financial, political scenario, military scenario, so they would get the crash. So why they do not exist yet? So, uh, so he, that, that point is very important. You can, so you can see that we are, in practical life, we are taking profit of the weakness of three machines somehow. Uh, okay, so I, this is uh, very quickly just to say that from, uh, from you, you, in quantum computation you change bits to qubits, and classically the basic unit information is a bit, a zero one. Quantum computation are these qubits, these kind of states. And much more complicated than bits, they cannot be described by the Boolean logic values. Zero, 1, because then you can occupy more states. So here you start to get a mathematical problem connected to bits and qubits. So you don't, you cannot rely on Boolean logic or the, and logic is related to Boolean algebra anymore because qubits can also be in a superposition of states and are intuitively speaking somehow in both states at the same time. So this is a very good uh, uh, property of quantum computation and some it, it's impossible to take a profit as Google Prasad mentioned of the massive uh, parallel computation but something can be done you can take some um, small profits some subtle profit uh, I always make a mistake so this is quantum computation to quantum information Quantum information is also is different from quantum computation. It's an attempt to use this kind of a parallel massive computation to uh, give us some new insights on information. When, for instance, it said that a, a Canadian company named DA, D Wave, in, as I, I could see, I could check in two, 2012, claims to have built a com quantum computer using 84 bits. But a quantum machine using no more than 300 qubits would be a million, million times faster than most modern computer. So if it really could do that, we are perhaps approaching in a new era of uh, 
taking profit of, of this kind of thing for, for quantum information. Okay, but this in principle has not much to do with quantum mechanics, but more uh, with uh, quantum computation, which is not exactly the same. Now, important question from my view is the following. What, wh why or why or how computers have to do with logic? Okay, this is a very subtle point. We know that connections between logic and computation come from Leibniz, Boole, Frege, Cantor, Hilbert, Hirdo, and Turing. How is that so? Well, because uh, uh, the Turing machine, the one mentioned by Prasha, by, by, by Palash, uh, Turing machines can be uh, axiomatized in first order logic. And coming from Turing machines, we get to very uh, uh, deep results like the, the Houghton problem by Turing and Gero's incomplete in uh, theorem it was all related to the Turing machine. So in a very deep way, computability is related to first order classical logic. Because everything can be axiomatized and then talking about models of this uh, logic and so on, we are we cannot this really separate models of first order logic from, from, from Turing machine. But on the other hand, both computer science and the logic are human creations. So, in a sense, it's not a surprise that they are tied together because we, as human people, we are tying them together, in a sense. But logic is also a spectacularly effective tool in database areas, so in modeling phenomena of uh, uh, big data, uh, the information on, on big, uh, massive data, and so on. So logic provides computer science with both a unifying framework and a powerful language. Okay. In this way, they are very much related. Not only from the practical point of view, I insist, but also from the theoretical point of view. Uh, but quantum computers may need something more than classical logic. So they may need non-classical logic. Why? Well, because quantum Turing machines cannot be formalized in a user logic because they are contradictory and classical logic would explode. So, Turing machines can be really uh, axiomatized and treated using classical first order logic, but quantum Turing machines, uh, oh, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, a, a Turing machine which would compute quantum algorithms cannot be formalized in user logic. And then paraconsistent logic are more cautious logic that we have seen that permit to reason under contradictions. So, by substituting such, theory, th such theories, the underlying logic by a paraconsistent logic, we obtain a new computation model called the paraconsistent Turing machine, the PTM. It can be formalized within paraconsistent first order logic, with a very respectable logic with uh, decidability properties or un undecidability properties, uh, model theory, proof theory, and everything. So you cannot, philosophically, there is no mathematical or foundational reason to say that quantum, but uh, consistent first order logic is not as respectable as classical first order logic. Now, this paraconsistent Turing machine, they allow a partial simulation of superposed states of quantum computing. We can define new algorithms in this machine which solve the Deutsche and deutsche osha problems that run on paraconsistent Turing machine. This was a paper in already three years old by my ex student, now professor in, in Colombia, Juan Carlos Agudelo and myself, and we have published it in the Journal of Logic and Computation showing that how this is feasible, how this can be done. So, paraconsistent Turing machines are then quantum machines, which seems to me as very, very, kind of a very nice surprise, in the sense that you take a non-standard logic, you axiomatize a new notion of machine, mm -hmm. and then you can show that this machine runs quantum, can it run quantum it algorithms. Somehow a nice surprise. I don't know how much, how, how can this be proceeded? What kind of new results could come out of that? But that was already a kind of um, important thing, according to my view. So the only difference between classical and computation lies in the efficiency, as has been already remarked. 
a Turing machine will solve any problem that can be, that's not good to read, but any problem that can be solved by a, a quantum computation by our parameters Turing machine. Just the TM would take an exponential amount of time, but it, that's a, a hard problem since our lives are finite. As, as, as this was mentioned, if a uh, computation takes one million years, it's just infeasible. But new concepts could emerge from here. Scientists began thinking of quantum physics in terms of information rather than just matter. So it's again also a paradigm to put together computation, uh, uh, computational information, which is not, not exactly connected by classical Turing machine. Okay, uh, we can also uh, make something different from Turing machine, which is we can make a quantum random generation generator, which would be a real true randomic uh, device, which is impossible in classical in classical uh, Turing machines, in classical computation, because any any time someone designs a quantum generator, continue on description. The digital procedure is usually a num a uh, artifact a human artifact for the sake of description. Now I will uh, invite uh, BP Sina uh, whether brain computes and how brain computes at all. Continue on description. The digital procedure is usually a, num a uh, artifact, a human artifact for the sake of description. Now I will uh, invite uh, BP Sina uh, whether brain computes and how brain computes at all. And uh, very good morning to all of you here. I am uh, really honored and uh, in the truest sense uh, I am really afraid of talking before such an august gathering of so many eminent scientists uh, in the interdisciplinary areas, physicists, logicians, uh, engineers and <coughs> computer scientists. Well, uh, as uh, Professor Rai just now pointed out that I would directly come to the topic under discussion. We have already heard from our previous speakers, Professor Palas Sarkar uh, about the computability, and Professor Sarkar about the quantum computation, and uh, about the physics question, and Professor Walter Carnelli about the logic and computation part. And so all the, all, uh, actually, all these are basically uh, uh, where towards the theoretical nature of this logic computation. And I would like to present whatever I would uh, tell here uh, from the point of view of an engineer. Okay. So th for that reason, let me see that what we really see or what we really uh, know about the brain. So we know, we, we need to understand the mechanism of this uh, information processing by uh, human brain. That's a real challenging problem. And uh, all we all know that uh, the modern computers are very fast and uh, say those compute in the speed of say uh, nanoseconds. One instruction is computed in the time of the order of say nanoseconds. Whereas uh, if we see the uh, neurons of the brain behavior so that uh, those neurons actually uh, respond to a rather slow in the order of milliseconds time. And uh, that is a real wonder to us that uh, yet with such a Slow processing speed of the brain, we can compute certain things uh, which can be done pretty quickly uh, compared to the digital computers. For example, say it, it, something would require probably hundreds of milliseconds by our brain, uh, whereas the most powerful computer can take some tens of seconds to solve the problem. The uh, common example is say if I give two photographs of the same person taken under different environments. And if it is given to a computer, modern day computer, very powerful computer, and uh, there are experts, I can see Professor Chaudhary is here. So, on image processing and computer vision, everything. And that will take perceptibly long time to decide that the two photographs refer to the same person. Of course, maybe they know there is some um, problem, so there is some differences also there. So, with all those things, it will come out with an exact result, whether those 
to the papers in the same person or not. But given, uh, if it is given to a human being, we all know that we just take a few seconds to decide that well, these are the, 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 the photographs of the same person. And uh, sometimes we have some doubt, but we just uh, accept that with certain amount of uncertainty, something like that. So this is a glaring example uh, to talk about the differences. But on the other hand, if you uh, talk about uh, the, the normal crunching operations, human brains uh, are uh, miserably slow. Uh, if I ask uh, anyone here to compute, uh, to, to multiply, say, 2,358 by 7,628, you won't be able to, uh, so quickly in, uh, giving it in one second or two seconds or three seconds time. But uh, if it is given to a digital computer, then that will produce the result in nanosecond time or the order of some several nanoseconds. So to uh, model this thing, so that's the real challenge. So we have already heard about whether uh, the Turing machine model can really do that thing. But the basic question already posed by Professor Rai was whether the brain functions in analog and digital manner. Uh, digital manner. So just going back to uh, that, what uh, John von Neumann already uh, told, that uh, probably I would uh, t come to that point later on, but my uh, personal uh, view is that, uh, yeah, no uh, system in this uh, physical world is actually uh, uh, digital or discrete by nature. Everything is continuous. So whatever we actually, uh, whatever uh, things actually happen inside our brain uh, should not be digital probably, okay? Well, but that's, uh, I cannot prove, anyway. But the main thing that what uh, Riman already told, that whenever we have certain things, uh, we see uh, certain things, and there are some neurophysiological changes. Yeah, so that's what are the basic features, just to uh, sum up all those things on one or two slides. The physiological basis of the human information processing is attributed to a huge interconnection network, so that is uh, my view, uh, or neuron fish function through excitatory and inhibitory inputs. And the number of neurons in the net is very finite, though very large, about 12 billion. And the fanning and fan out number of neurons are also bounded. The upper bound is of the order of say, thousands. The interconnection pattern changes slowly with adaptive learning. The net starts with some random configuration of the units and evolves through adaptive pattern matching and learning. Uh, we also have this parallelism concept that is involved in brain functioning. This quantum computing may possibly uh, implement that, but that's a separate question which will come later. But uh, functionality, uh, whether, I mean, when functionality is concerned, then we will certainly find that some sort of parallelism is involved in brain functioning through simultaneous activation and deactivation of many neurons. The brain exhibits the stability plasticity dilemma. The plasticity means uh, the brain is uh, adaptive, so our brain can re really learn certain things and some new things. Uh, from some consistent uh, uh, events. But the stability thing that it, uh, if it is uh, some irrelevant things, uh, then uh, those information are not really changed. So we just discard some irrelevant things, but whenever there are some relevant things, we uh, just update our knowledge about that thing. So that's a great dilemma that how would we actually uh, separate out between the relevant and irrelevant things. And uh, accordingly, we, uh, this uh, learning process is being carried out inside the new world. So one possible view to explain this thing is to view the brain as a universal pattern matter. So I do not know whether we should uh, be finally uh, implement that by a Turing machine or a, uh, a quantum Turing machine or a paraconsistent uh, Turing machine, something like that. But just to view, at, from the point of view of an engineer, I would like to see that this is a universal pattern matter. And the whole of cognition and learning of the neural net is through adaptive pattern matching and unsupervised pattern learning. The pattern matching is performed in an associative manner. Okay. Human brain abstracts the distinguishing features of the objects about which it is interested to give information. So this is a very uh, interesting thing, that how these features, which we call here as attributes, collectively define an object in a particular class of type. The set of attributes needed to define an object is very much dependent on the particular class that object belongs to. Uh, if you take the example of uh, the whole universe of objects, possibly you can divide that uh, set of objects as the animate objects and inanimate objects. Animate objects can further be classified into animals and planets. Uh, animals can be further subdivided into uh, uh, plants. Animals can be further subdivided into human and non-human beings and so on. 
for example, if you consider the attribute set, so this, uh, whatever we see, uh, so any sort of uh, information which is actually being paid to the input, and uh, from those information we actually uh, derive, our brain can actually uh, derive some sort of attribute from uh, that information. So that is a very interesting thing, and how that uh, is being done, we really do not know. I do not know whether the uh, neuroscientists can throw some light on that. So if you see from the point of view of an engineer again, so an attribute set needed to calculate the pet animals, for example. So we need some attribute like size, limbs, uh, body cover, movement type like that. Size attribute may have some values, normal and so on. Maybe again, uh, uh, we do not know that we, we just uh, classify it into terms of some uh, not exact values, but some approximate values, so normal or sort. By that, we do not know how our brain actually looks understand that it is a normal thing or it is a short one. The links can attribute, a link attribute may have values like four legs, two wings, two wings, and two legs like that. Body cover attribute may have values here, feather. In this way, the, uh, uh, some sort of attribute may be classified to the objects. Again, if we, through pattern learning, uh, say, if say the value of the size may be changed to normal, short, large, very large like that. So this is a kind of this plasticity uh, behavior of the brain. The values for body cover may be changed to, say, hair, feather, scale, and so on. So pattern matching and pattern learning go on in an intermingled way. If a pattern is shown and it does not match with existing patterns, immediately an information that is created, uh, information unit is created which stores this new pattern abstracted in a convenient way. Redefining the set of values of one or more attributes as explained above may also be necessary for the storage of the new pattern. Um, there is a notion uh, which we term as the grade learning process that if the set of values of an attribute gets changed, all the cells storing old patterns of the same subclass may need to be modified suitably. Again, the plasticity behavior. And grade learning is a part of the pattern learning process. Matching of pattern is possibly performed in several steps with different degrees or levels of the details. This in turn needs a hierarchical structuring of the attribute sets. So given a pattern for matching with the existing stored patterns, first only the attributes to the highest level are considered, disregarding all the details. And this is followed by a matching on the attributes at the next lower level, uh, carrying a little more detailed information about the object pattern, and so on. This process is continued until the desired uh, level uh, of matching attains the uh, degree of uh, confidence, or the number of failures is encountered, and then we say that, well, this is not the uh, thing which you want. So on this model of, so what we propose that, uh, that it is a kind of computation through pattern matching. Any problem to be solved by our brain should be considered in terms of some basic pattern matching steps at different levels of details. Uh, suppose I am uh, uh, given the uh, problem that I have to multiply two numbers. So that is actually uh, done by our human brain by uh, using some uh, patterns of rules, so how to uh, multiply numbers. So there are some rules that well, we have to find out first the least significant digits of the two uh, numbers, and then there is a, again a pattern of rules for finding the one digit by one digit, the table. So that is also a pattern of rule. And after that, what will you do? What will you do with the uh, result, uh, uh, least significant digit, and the remaining part? So that, that is also again a set of rules, everything like that. And uh, say, so even if we consider that well, we are as, uh, actually addressing some, uh, so I, I am actually uh, talking here, and if somebody some, uh, asks some question, then how to react to that question, so that is also known to me by uh, virtue of a previously known pattern of rules, okay? That pattern of rules or etiquette or whatever it is. So in this way, if you can say that the algorithm developed on such a pattern matching uh, model, which you can call as, as a new algorithm, not algorithm, may probably need to redefine the boundary of entry conflict problems. So this is just an abstracted view of the whole thing, that uh, maybe that those problems which are very difficult to be done by, uh, computed by the classical uh, Turing machine model, uh, may be easy, uh, much easier to solve uh, by a human brain. And the reverse, uh, the vice versa is also applicable. So that, right, just, uh, we started with the uh, question of uh, identifying the two uh, photographs, the persons on the two photographs. 
and uh, so that is that is pretty difficult to be computed by uh, the Turing uh, model. On the other hand, it's much easier by your human brain. So there is the question that well, we can redefine possibly the uh, difficult or the more difficult uh, problems by uh, using this model because the computational complexity very much depends on the computing model we would use for solving the problem. Well, if you want to do the verification of this model, so that's the main problem. The main hurdle in the verification of this model is the hardware realization of the attribute extraction phase. Uh, the rest can be implemented through associative memory, simple logic circuits, but that is the main problem. For example, if you see that this is the uh, uh, hall where I can uh, see so many uh, chairs, so many people, and like that, so many other uh, objects, right? So everything comes uh, all in uh, one shot, and uh, all these effects are actually uh, uh, coming to our brain in one shot. But there is possibly no such camera till now, which will take a snapshot of the whole thing, forgetting about the 3D uh, perspective, which will take a snapshot of the whole thing and then make a semantic separation of the different parts of the image. <coughs> So, a semantic, so if that type of camera could have evolved, that will definitely again uh, require some sort of pattern matching operation on the image uh, plane and to make a sub semantic separation of the different things, different objects. Uh, and if that <coughs> thing could be done, given to the system, then possibly things could very uh, I mean nearly mimic the pattern of the uh, behavior of the brain. So th that is the main thing that attribute extraction phase will involve acquisition of some semantic information about the pattern. Well, I do not actually, uh, if I want to add that, do I have one minute time? Okay. So, uh, so if you want to again uh, address the thing that whether our brain really computes or not, my personal view is that, uh, yeah, it's really computes. Well, the, if we take the example of, say, uh, apple falling of, of apples under gravitation or uh, 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 planet orbiting uh, around the sun, or uh, maybe that uh, you have got some several resistances, say battery is connected, uh, I mean, uh, <coughs> a battery is there in a uh, electric circuit, and there are there is one path, but there are some multiple uh, resistances in parallel, and the current is automatically divided like that, okay, it doesn't really conflict. Well, uh, there are some, the physical phenomena, those are, all those physical phenomena are definitely governed by physical laws, and uh, what uh, Christian already told that well, possibly you can, or, or the logic and computation, whatever it is, it is beyond that thing. So we see the are actually done by us human beings. So, but those definitely do not violate the physical law. Any Turing machine implementation definitely involves certain uh, physical materials which uh, really uh, actually follow the physical laws and rules. So we are not really uh, avoid, uh, I mean, violating any physical laws. But on the top of that, certain other things are. There, yeah. I don't know, to call it a metaphysical thing or whatever, that, that is actually there and that is what is happening inside our brain. Uh, the physical chemical process is very complex. So it is not, not just uh, so simple to think that, well, there should be some physical law which will automatically explain the brain's behavior. It is something more than the uh, physical uh, law. And because uh, given the same scenario or the same circumstances or the same input, Two human brains actually compute or uh, I mean react in a different manner. But the basic point of whether brain computes or not, so that is my, my view is that well definitely computes because we have to make decisions at each and every step. And if you can make decisions, that is the I mean, basis of the computation. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think Bhavani uh, is. Uh, coming slowly to the point that uh, whether uh, physical laws can explain the functioning of the brain. This is one of the most challenging questions in modern neuroscience. And uh, one is, uh, he is telling about decision making or computability of the brain. I, I will supplement with one slide. Uh, we, we did an estimate with a very simple example that if uh, brain really computes in the sense of modern computer, then what happens? I will give you a simple example. <coughs> and we published in a paper uh, this kind of things. Uh, let us think that there is a carton of milk in the refrigerator. And we are going to take the carton of milk from the refrigerator. In most of the cases, we can do it. We don't fail it. But uh, let us little bit go further from uh, physiological point of view. Uh, let us have a heuristic description. 
Uh, generally, there are 50 or so key muscles in the hand, and uh, hand, arm, and shoulder, which one uses to reach for the milk of carton. And there will be over 10 to the power 15 combinations of muscle contractions. This is a staggering number to say the least if during every millisecond of this reaching or gasping sequence, the signal best of the 10 to the power 15 combination is chosen. After an evaluation of all possibilities, then 10 to the power 18 decisions would have to be made every second. And this should relegate the brain if it were to be a computer to be one exahertz, that is one million gigahertz. I don't think uh, brain can be thought of such a gigantic processor for the simple act of taking a cartoon of milk from the refrigerator, you need a processor of one exahertz. So, in a sense, I support his view that uh, maybe brain, brain computes in some other way. And now we have a neuroscientist with us, Javi Joseph. He might shed some light uh, from neurophysiological point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please put the microphone a bit higher. Yeah. Quite uh, different in complexity uh, of its behavior and uh, uh, the kind of stuff that goes on in the brain uh, after uh, a grasshopper. But uh, however, uh, so this is the human brain and this is a grasshopper's half brain. But if you look at the, and roughly this is like two millimeters and this is sort of a scale of centimeters, right? And if you look inside you, what you see uh, common to both of them are this network of neurons. And the neurons uh, are form connections with each other, which probably all of you know about, which are synapses, right? And each of these neurons, uh, if you look at the electrical potential of inside of the neuron with respect to the outside, you may see activities which are good uh, with time like this, uh, which are uh, each of these vertical bars represent what is called an action potential of a spike, which is thought to be a decision point for the neuron uh, to generate it or not generate it. As far as we know, uh, as of now, uh, yeah, yeah. the difference between these two are simply in terms of the number of neurons and the kind of connectivity. We don't, as of now, know of any, any, any very strong property differences between in the neurons which you find in these versus this, or any particular kind of phenomena uh, which other than the generating out of the complexity in terms of larger number of neurons and connectivity between these two systems. So, uh, so that sort of uh, makes us think that uh, what enables the task which we do as compared to what grasshoppers do uh, comes from this extensive connectivity that, that happens. Uh, so basically the, the synapse is connection between two neurons and whenever those action potentials reach the pre-synapse, which is uh, here, uh, it communicates a message to the post-synapse which is not like that binary thing which we saw in the previous slide. It doesn't look like this. It's an analog signal which communicates between the pre-synapse and the post-synapse. So, uh, so, so let us say this line is the information coming in from the pre-synapse and this is the post-synaptic neuron, this uh, round stuff. So these uh, symbolic representations uh, would be what the individual pairs of neurons uh, how they would go about computing if it were to compute a uh, not and an or. So if you can see that not is basically uh, inhibition of the post synapse neuron. Whenever the pre synapse uh, generates an action potentially, it stops the activity of the post synapse. If it's a NAND operation, these two should generate action potential and the strength of connection between them should be large enough that it exceeds certain amount. Then only it generates an action potential in this cell 
it should indicate an end operation. If, uh, if either of them are strong enough and any one of them generates action potential, it can evoke activity in the post synapse, which would be sort of all operation. So what is sort of interesting is that if you simply change the connection between uh, the connection strength here, which is possible in the, in the brain, uh, which is called the plasticity of the brain, uh, you can change from between operations on and and. So in some sense, if you are looking at the brain as a, a set of logical operators connected together, so this is uh, by changing these strengths, you can generate arbitrary kinds of computation that you would want. And such changes are uh, have been seen, and you can even see the very physical uh, physical change happening within seconds. Like a connectivity which is having this much size would change to this much size and back and forth. So you can make these kind of changes and make a configurable computing machine out of the brain. That's what's going on all the time. Now, uh, coming to the uh, parallel, massive parallelism which you would see uh, in the uh, in a quantum computer versus the kind of parallelism which you would see in our human brain, uh, I would say that uh, you cannot, of, of course, achieve the kind of infinite possible computations happening because of superpositions. But the brain has such a large amount of wiring going from, say, this is the visual pathway going from the retina onto the visual cortex and probably somewhere around here, which, has, which are effect, ineffective, sufficient for causing perception. Uh, almost everything is computed, and then it's selected for. So in some sense, that's the kind of parallelism which is happening. For example, if you look at the retina, you would see that there are some neurons if you, which you look at would generate an action potential only when such a pattern happens in the retina. And there are so many other networks which there will be another network which would fire only when the bar happens say, this way. Another another network would fire, another neuron would fire when the bar happens this way. All these neurons which can possibly excite and indicate the presence of any one of them are always present. So that is the parallelism which we are talking about when we talk about brain. So it's like a huge number of possible detectors and points as we go up the chain of the, of the, the visual system. So there are places where we, it, it would detect edges, there would be places where it would detect more complex features and so it, is, it depends, it seems to be, from what we know as of now, which neuron spikes uh, sort of indicates inside the brain the representation for a particular feature in the external world, based on something. So for example, people have shown that simple features like this detected at the periphery will get compounded because of the synaptic connections and will compute such complex features. So there would be neurons which would fire for this, just because they get input from these neurons, which detect these kind of patterns. So you have to understand that all, all such possible computations are already there. I mean, it just needs to be excited based on the stimulus which would come in. So for example, if you record from a higher center in the, or, or in the individual pathway of the monkey brain, so this activity uh, the, the stimulus is presented during the time where these bars are indicated. You can see that there are these are the stimulus which are presented, and you can see that there are particular stimuli which would cause large number of spikes in that neuron. So this neuron, in some sense, uh, is uh, indicative that there is such a figure of phase in the visual field of that monkey, right? So and people have shown experiments in which if you uh, Stimulate these kind of neurons, which are supposed to cause cause these spaces, you can cause perception of the same thing which would happen in the external world. Yeah, so there are people have tried to model. So, so what is important in this uh, scenario is that it seems to imply that a few neurons, in a neuron or a subset of neurons, spiking seems to code for a particular. Uh, uh, the uh, information in, uh, or extracted information in the brain. Now it's possible that the single neuron can get contradictory information. 
right? And, th and there are good examples for that. Uh, so, for example, if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the, the circuitry which controls our eye movement, right? So, if something that appears in the visual periphery, you have a tendency to look there suddenly, right? And of course, same thing if there is a loud sound happening in a particular location, you have a tendency to move your eyes in that direction. The circuitry which controls these movements in the brain are very close to each other, and they talk to each other, meaning there are lateral connections which talk to each other. Now suppose you are in a room alone, and then you find that uh, there is a sound coming from a particular location suddenly, and then you move your eyes there, and you expect that you detect a new object there, or something generating the sound there, right? And if you don't find that object there, what do you feel? You feel that either you feel scared, because it's something which is scared, to the sound coming from there, there's no object generating that sound. And But then suddenly you discover that, uh, oh, a friend jumps out from behind the sun, and he was just trying to scare you by making this strange sound from behind a basket or something like that. Right? And then the, suddenly the the fear transfers into something called mirth, right? So it looks like for uh, for us, the uh, we don't we the, the neurons or the brain is wired such a way that uh, it cannot accommodate yeah, it cannot accommodate contradiction. So it always wants to avoid contradiction. So uh, it, there are two emotional components which are seems to be uh, corresponding to the contradiction, which is favorable or unfavorable. Uh, yeah, so uh, it seems like so the neurons which detect this contradiction, the detection of contradiction in the brain seems to be that when there are two networks trying to enforce two different activities on the same neuron or a subset of neurons. So that seems to be the kind of uh, uh, representation of contradiction uh, in the human brain. So I think, uh, so what I, I would like to conclude uh, by is saying that though we think that the computer is a very digital uh, system, so this program uh, with IBM Watson, with, uh, which played against this human uh, in this game called Jeopardy, is a quiz. And what you can see that it has to make decisions, but uh, these decisions though, this computer is very binary, uh, and uh, basically implementing the generalized uh, Turing machine. You can see it is giving you uh, measures of accuracy. So it is not like it has to, uh, it is, it can have based on uh, heuristics and, and uh, um, measures of metrics. You can have uh, levels of confidences which may be contradictory. So it's not necessary that a binary machine like this generate binary decisions uh, all the time. So I, I would like to stop there. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, the thing is, uh, whenever we think, we cannot think two things at a time. So, uh, if the parallelism occur within the uh, within the neurons internally, so ultimately we have to convert that we are thinking in a particular direction. That is one. That's the last speaker was speaking on. Then uh, I would uh, third speaker said that physical descriptions and reality. There should be some coherence between physical description and realities. Sure. So I, uh, we have come across one uh, article in uh, Science Conference on Uncertainty Quantification in uh, uh, 2012, uh, where we have seen that uh, the uh, deterministic paradigm of quantum physics. That means so far we know that the Solution of Schrodinger's equation is a probability of O. It's basically based on this superposition principle, superposition of many states. So un until and unless deterministic paradigm is arrived, uh, how can we say anything about uh, deterministic computation uh, in this life? That uh, lastly, I would uh, uh, say that this. 
determinism, deterministic, this thing of thought, uh, thinking process, uh, if we want to, we would like to uh, thought read. Thought read means whenever I'm thinking something, I'm suppose meditating something on some uh, subject. So we are in a matter energy paradigm in the sense that we are spending energy. If that energy, however feeble it is, if that energy can be accessed and can be, that can be processed, it's a, just like high, high energy level, high energy physics, it's a low, low energy physics. Then I, I see some hope that uh, with, with the modern technology, we, we would be able to, uh, able to thought read. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe I don't understand the, all the questions, but if I take one uh, question that uh, the makes, that <coughs> if, if uh, the physics is not deterministic, like quantum mechanics retail, it is indeterministic in some sense, but if it is not deterministic, then how can we proceed? How the things can occur? Uh, uh, in quantum mechanics, there is uncertainty relation, but uncertainty relation does not mean that there is no state for which some of the observable has definite value. So even quantum mechanics is probabilistic. There are some states for every observable where the observable has definite value. Like if a electron is in this room, and if you measure the position of the electron, then you're sure to get the electron in this room itself. So. <coughs> But there are some other observable for every state where it's uncertain. Now, it does not hamper this quantum computation. Because quantum computation, I could not show my slides, that quantum mechanics, as I told you, that there are some computational problems where quantum mechanics solves those problems very fast, which is otherwise impossible in classical computer. But, you can see there are some problems where you can get there are some copy, you get the answer with certainty. Like George Salgaridin, he mentioned, <coughs> Professor Walter mentioned, it does not help for this quantum computation. Because quantum computation, I could not show my slides, that quantum mechanics, as I told, that there are some computational problems where quantum mechanics solve those problems very fast, which is otherwise impossible in classical computer. But you can see there are some problems where you can get, there are some computational problems where you get the answer with certainty. Like George Salgaridin, he mentioned, <coughs> Professor Walter mentioned, you can get the result with uh, deterministically. Final. So, is getting the result exactly does not have any contradiction with the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. Uh, any other? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would just like to uh, uh, mention something regarding these observation structures. Also, the observation that we cannot, a brain cannot think more than uh, two things at a time. I think that's not really true because whenever I am so talking to you, I am uh, also um, uh, moving my hands and possibly I am also uh, trying to open the ball. I mean, uh, the bottle. Okay. So at a time when I, when I drive the car, then I have to look at uh, my surroundings and also operate all my uh, components of the car. Yes. So parallelism in brain is in here. question is uh, just uh, maybe may sound very naive, but just I want to address uh, the last innocent speaker and Professor Walter that uh, does it make sense to uh, differentiate between syntax and semantics what is going on from just our reception and to brain at what level actually meaning gets coupled with the syntactic totality. Uh, 
this is one question and if really i don't know if superposition principle really holds at the level of neuron then is there anything like syntactic closer at the level which gets somehow leaked and make our cognition possible i don't know whether i can <coughs> make my question clear can i repeat my question is my question is clearly one thing is when meaning is getting coupled with the syntactic totality of what we receive through our senses first thing and if what we receive through our senses are just syntactic totality then we are actually semantic stars at what level and at how this is just one thing and the another part of the question is if i don't know whether superposition principle is really working in our level of neuron if that is true there will be some kind of what i can ask uh, i can prefer to term as syntactic closer because there is a kind of infinite regress the principle of quantum mechanics so somehow that regress has to be leaked so that the meaning is possible and cognition is possible and i can make of this thing so so the, for the first part i uh, Uh, I don't think we know where the 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 this is or is or even if there is or if there is a clear boundary between the uh, extraction of information or features from the sensory stimuli uh, and uh, a point at which it simply uh, becomes uh, a semantic percept. I, I don't know whether we uh, know of such uh, situations. Uh, we know that there are places where if you uh, stimulate, it is sufficient to cause you a percept. That we know, but. Uh, that may also be because it activates so many other downstream of uh, those activities about superposition uh, at the in the quantum mechanical sense uh, we don't really have uh, information about uh, such superpositions across the brain but uh, there are hypotheses regarding such superposition within single neuron uh, um, so i don't know the i should answer for the later part of second question which uh, happens only if there is superposition in the brain uh, so in quantum mechanical sense Maybe I can add uh, some more information. That uh, yeah, sure. Cognitive science and Kahneman is also involved in that. That who won Nobel Prize? Uh, they found that uh, uh, the data which they got from experiments that do not satisfy the law, additional law, of classical probability theory. So their alternate interpretation is that if you can use quantum probability, it is very abstract science. then probably those data in cognitive science can be explained then the uh, responsibility goes to neuroscientists how do you understand this kind of superposition in terms of neuronal file this is very very difficult issue uh, i don't know the answer yet if you know you can go ahead I'm not currently aware of any uh, neurophysiological uh, explanation for the kind of uh, behavioral results from tiny events. Uh, I mean, I don't even, I not even thought about uh, um, whether uh, it's beyond the uh, parallel computation kind of things, which is possible uh, in human brain. Uh, so, for example, if you take uh, the uh, the savants, savants who can sort of uh, uh, literally see uh, prime numbers, so. uh in those cases uh, we, uh we probably does better than the com computers in seeing the prime numbers which are uh, usually uh, uh are uh, synesthetic in the sense that they actually see colors in particular prime numbers. so i think such computation which we think sort of uh, in the classical turing series computation may be looking very different uh, can possibly arise uh, in a simple parallel uh, network in the brain if it is complex enough uh, maybe at certain level of the hierarchy not uh, okay thank you so any other question sorry yes. okay. uh, so finally uh, at micro level everything is quantum so there must be superposition there must be uncertainty all these thing but the question is uh, regarding brain function thinking process whether superposition plays a role it has to be clearly Enunciated because uh, say 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 uh, say how bird flies. So so uh, for these actually we have to learn uh, we have to understand the geometry, steepness, strength of the uh, uh, flyer. Uh, but anyway, all these properties arises from 
from uh, atomic level bonding. So, but we don't go to, for explaining all these things, how what class, we don't go to the atomic bonding. So, uh, so finally in brain, if you go to the micro level, there may be superposition, but the question is whether that superposition play a role uh, for computation, like uh, whether this parallel, uh, the parallel, uh, massive parallelism in quantum mechanics, whether it occurs in the brain and give results uh, in a uh, fundamental way. But still now, uh, there is uh, there is no uh, there is no development regarding this thing because we have not seen uh, coherence uh, that is needed for such quantum computation uh, that is needed uh, is not yet found because this decoherence deco time is very very short for which quantum computation most possibly may not be possible and, uh, and the other thing brains brain to learn the brain does not uh, factorize numbers faster than even classical computers. So, so factor, factoring a, a large number is not the main function of the brain. <coughs> so, superposition must be there at uh, micro level, but whether it, it actually takes a, a role in our thought process or um, function of the brain, that is a different question which has to be well posed also. Yeah, uh, let me add something. Uh, it's very recent development regarding smell. The conventional theory of smell says that if a molecule fits to the receptor, then we get order. This is fine. But again, it is found that two identical molecules, identical in shape and size, they give rise to different order. So how is it possible? There is a man called Lukaturin. He's a Greek person, was in Cambridge. So he suggested that uh, the molecules which are identical in shape and size, they have the internal vibration of bond, which is quantum mechanical in nature, are different. So uh, these quantum mechanical vibration or quantum mechanical principles help us to differentiate the uh, dif two different orders or two identical size and shape of the molecule. So now this is the beginning of a new story and maybe we will be able to understand more on quantum principles and how brain understands or how brain uh, talks regarding different ways. Okay, so we have... I would like to make a small observation and a small question to particularly to Joby Joseph. <coughs> See, in this lecture we have been beautifully introduced to the concept of computability by Polashwarkar and others and uh, to the concept of brain to some extent. But the title of the, the roundtable discussion was Brain, Contradictions and Computability. So we didn't have much exposition on the role of contradictions between computations and uh, between brain and computability. Okay, so my question is something like that. I agree with you uh, in the fact that... Contradictory perception occurs within me and I either get scared or I try to search I give more attention and try to search for it more intently. The same thing happens for visual illusions also, because we try to look at the world in some way, but the stimulus is so creative that we don't find what we actually want. So it creates a perception of illusions. Okay, But my uh, question is that actually contradictions do play a role in doing the computations. In the macro scale, it is true, we want to avoid contradictions. But without contradictions, we cannot actually compute. For example, you mentioned about the phenomena at the cellular level, at the network level of lateral inhibition. So lateral inhibition is actually contradictory. If light falls on the center, it fires. If light falls on the surround, it doesn't fire for an, for an on-centered cell. It is the other way around for an off-centered cell. So everywhere there is contradiction. There is an on-centered cell, there is an off-centered cell. There is an excitatory region, there is an inhibitory region. Then you come to the level of the transmission of information. There is a magnocellular layer, there is a parvocellular layer. The magno is carrying the information about motion. And the parvo is ca carrying information about color. So they are uh, taking two different information. And in fact, magno is carrying information earlier than the parvo. So uh, that we can measure from visual latency. So there is contradiction all around. And without contradiction actually, the brain possibly cannot compute. 
So it is by through the contrast. So I would very much like that you shed some light on this phenomena. You solved the contradiction. So uh, if uh, usually uh, when there are uh, two uh, neighboring regions uh, receiving uh, uh, light, say for example, and there's some overlap of the regions you said as the um, detection of centers around. Uh, the, in some sense, maybe if there are certain situations when the brain has to decide that uh, it is at a particular location that the centers around is happening and not at the neighboring location, which also seems to give some signal. So this is a contradiction which brain has to resolve here or there. Now, uh, brain apparently uh, uh, doesn't, uh, at least uh, at many places, doesn't like to uh, say it's at both places. It, it, and the lateral inhibition is the mechanism by which it decides, okay, this is in one place and not at the other. So lateral inhibition seems to be a mechanism which enables us to resolve uh, uh, contradictions in uh, uh, many uh, places. Um, and uh, and um, of course, the brain, I don't think, is worried about truth, right? Brain is worried about survival. So uh, almost all the parallel networks which are there in the brain is not that it's exhaustively parallel in computing everything, but uh, it is uh, approximating, uh, uh, it is actually trying to compute what is relevant for survival and to us, uh, it will look like it is approximating many things fairly well. For example, it's ed detecting edges, most of the time we detect edges and uh, uh, it sees parallel lines uh, meeting at the end. So you, if for the same reason you can put uh, 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 lines with angle on a paper and make you feel that uh, it is going to the uh, infinity. So it's only trying to approximate things. So it's not worried about truth. Right? So I, I think logic often worries about truth. So I think that's really the sort of problem maybe we are. Yes. So it's trying to create a model for itself. Right. Okay. A any other question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, so I just add one thing. Uh, I don't know, uh, well, logic, as you mentioned, is worried about truth, but that is probably not correct. I mean, again, correct or incorrect is a different uh, Logic, as, we, as it is studied, is, uh, uh, well, what is truth is a very difficult thing to address, of course. Uh, there are some logical principles, and you apply them, and uh, you have some formalism. So these are certain ways of reasoning and so on. So whether logic addresses truth is a more philosophical question than is really understood in a, in a formal logic sense. And to come to uh, what Kuntal was mentioning, I think uh, now we are kind of, uh, uh, we are spreading a little bit, like uh, what do you mean by the word contradiction? So the, in the, well, in, in my talk, I talked about proof by contradiction, diagonalization. That was in the classical logical sense, uh, logical sense of uh, the meaning of contradiction, that both can't be true at the same, same time. Now, the, in the sense that uh, Kuntal was using it, it seemed to be a little bit broader, that if you have a kind of a duality, that is also a contradiction. Now, uh, of course, uh, it, this, this can also be thought of contradiction. What, what you mean by contradiction, in a more uh, general uh, usage of the word, is, is very difficult to pin down. But if you don't pin down the, the at least, uh, cannot pinpoint it exactly, but at least get some sense of uh, the, the, the meaning of the, the gist of the word, then uh, our discussions will be going heavier. And I think the same is true of uh, computation also. So what is meant by computation? Well, uh, what is meant by computation in the sense uh, formalized by Turing, Church, Codel, and others is this notion of effective computability, and I tried to put that down uh, as, a, as a finitary process and so on and so forth. That is the sense in which, in which uh, the, the word computability is used in the context of, of Turing machine. Now, of course, computability could mean much, much more, like Walter gave this example of, of computing by gravity. I'm, I'm not sure that Turing machines can com, uh, can model that. Uh, so again, what is meant by computation? Computation, uh, and uh, then comes the question of we have been hearing of, of cognition of thought processes. Now, can machines think? So that's a, a question that would belong to AI, and that would take us into the realm of uh, of 
artificial intelligence and uh, well then the, the, the fundamental thing about giving test. So maybe uh, just to again get back to Kuntal's point, I think uh, Kuntal was using the word contradiction in a much more broader sense than was discussed here. Okay, so uh, next question. Yeah, please. Uh, so when you think about the brain, so uh, there are different ways um, in which different brains interpret a particular thing. Uh, so maybe uh, the, there is an incident, uh, people might interpret it in uh, very different ways. So, so given that, um, given one instance, there can be so many interpretations, is it, is it possible uh, to formalize the exact functioning or uh, everything that goes into the brain in some kind of a formal uh, manner using some formal theory? Uh, maybe. So, um, I, I don't know that I can call this interpretation, uh, but uh, if you take a honeybee, for example, uh, you can take two honeybees, and one honeybee you train it to uh, associate a particular orderant uh, with rewards of sucrose. So, whenever uh, thereafter you apply that orderant to the honeybee, it will extend its proboscis to bring that uh, sucrose. And another honeybee you can train the same orderant. Uh, now to associate with some shock or something like that. And then that honeybee would uh, withdraw itself uh, when the quadrant is given. So uh, now these two honeybees interpret the same stimuli in two different ways. So I don't know whether that's the sense in which you are saying interpretation of the stimuli. Uh, I mean, we do it at a much higher level in the sense sense. We associate that stimuli with so many things. I mean, if that's the sense of interpretation I'm talking about. So I don't, I, um, so we are not, uh, I think when we are trying to understand uh, uh, the brain at the kind of work which I do, for example, we don't try to uh, look at the individual, but how is it that an individual is given this capability to form this interpretation, which may be depending on the individual's experience. So uh, uh, I don't know that I answered no, uh, you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so generally when we are talking about these kind of discussions there is always uh, this uh, question of can he actually build an intelligent machine that can actually simulate our brain and uh, so that is where the question comes because uh, this interpretation the, the way brain interprets can it actually be formalized so that we can actually build a machine that can encompass whatever the brain does or I don't know whether it can be formalized because uh, building it is different from getting it formalized, right? Because uh, um, you can create this maybe simple neural network which will uh, do a job very well after training, but you may not really have a formal way of telling what, how it is going about doing the task. So I think formalization may not be achieved, but it may be possible that we'll create uh, systems complex enough which will look, I mean, complex enough uh, from, from current uh, time. Okay. Uh, that, as you know, uh, is the famous problem of Turing test. Uh, that Turing had proposed this test that uh, can you distinguish between a machine and a, 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 a person, a human being. Now that uh, presupposes, well, uh, it's actually a brilliant idea. This notion of uh, formalizing, this notion of uh, uh, of thinking. Uh, actually, completely bypassing the notion of thinking by uh, introducing this notion of indistinguishability uh, between a, a computer and a, uh, or a machine and a human. But then it presupposes what is this machine that uh, you'd like to uh, think about. So, well, Turing obviously would have had, he doesn't mention it in his paper, but he obviously would have had uh, the notion of Turing machine in the, in the background. So, so. And to, to complete the question, can you can can is it possible to distinguish a Turing machine from a from a human being? But uh, the, the the more deeper question is, can you have a machine which has uh, more capability in in some sense in a in a more broader sense of the notion of computation than a Turing machine? Uh, then of course it should be possible to distinguish. But then uh, these are. Okay, have the last question. Maybe uh, yeah. You seem to presuppose that we can identify uh, subjects with, with the brain, but it seems to be the case, at least to me, that
that we use the brain to think. So I have this more Cartesian intuition, without the book by being a dualist. But I don't, don't think we can be, as individuals, identified with our brains or with any part of our bodies. It seems to me that we use our brains to think. Who, so, who is the we? Who is the we using the brain? I speak for myself when I speak about us. But you are speaking, so oh. you are speaking, you, there is no separate you, I different from your brain. Yes, I'm different from my brain, yes. But uh, I was not uh, addressing you in particular, so I was, uh, if you if you please let me finish. But this seems to be just one one kind of intuition that some of us have anyway. And I'm not, I don't, I'm not in any way a dualist. And it seems that some other uh, uh, suppositions you make, uh, uh, or that you seem to, to presuppose that we, that the brain makes computations. But that seems false to me, because a computation is a mathematical object. But the, the brain is a physical object. There are processes in the brain, and these processes may, as other processes, be interpreted as, as um, computations. So I don't know if you have any maybe comments or, or opposing views uh, relating to what I said. We, we create similar objects in, in, our, in our creative uh, 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 interpretations or, uh, or acts. But the physical processes are not computations. So, I mean, this famous book by Hubert Dreyfus, right? What, com what can, what, I don't not remember the title anymore, what computers cannot do or something like this. Well, uh, I don't think a computer can even add two and two and get four. It is only by an interpretation that we take it, the result to be an addition. I, I, that very much depends upon you looking at this uh, uh, church Turing definition or church Turing uh, 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 yeah, the def definition or thesis, right? Thesis as a definition or a, a, as a philosophical thesis, right? You take strictly that this uh, is a definition, then there's no other way as to, 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 the, to compute as Turing machine does. But if you take it as a philosophical open thesis, then you may find some other things which can be computed, and they are not computed by a Turing machine. And also, of course, you are right, the computation involves a kind of semantic interpretation. Yeah, you, you always need that, but that's inherent in any, any aspects. So if you see the planet, if you, take, if you consider that a planet circulating is computing something, you have to have an, a semantic for interpreting. But you always need that, even for calculations in mathematics. Okay, so we are running ahead of time, and we need to close the session because we have a tutorial after that. Uh, thank you, all the panelists. And thank you all the audience for this kind of nice moment.